Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama. Hare, Hare Krishna, dear devotees, and uh, welcome once again to our Unity and Diversity YouTube channel. Uh, and as we continue our series of interviews on this very intriguing and important topic, uh, we bring to you today His Grace Sureshwar Prabhu. So Sureshwar Prabhu, uh, welcome to this channel. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Venanga Prabhu. Uh, so Sureshwar Prabhu joined the Hare Krishna movement in 1970 and received first and second initiations from Srila Prabhupada in 1971 and 72. Now, over the years, Sureshwar Prabhu's service has centered around primarily Srila Prabhupada's books, studying them, distributing them, helping to produce them, writing articles based on them, and now teaching from them as well. So back in 2011, while teaching at the Mayapur Institute for Higher Education, MIHE, his concern over the lack of connection many younger devotees, you know, the many younger devotees are feeling for our founder Acharya, you know, it reached a tipping point. So that year he began researching and presenting his seminar series, Srila Prabhupada, our founder Acharya. So with the encouragement of the Mahapur Institute and the GBC committee, Srila Prabhupada's position, um, Suresh Prabhupada began presenting this series around this con world in 2012. And during the pandemic, he has been teaching a, a streamlined version online on Zoom called the Founder Acharya Essentials, helping devotees deepen their relationship with and commitment to and love for our beloved Founder Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. So Suresh Prabhu, let's uh, just uh, dive right into it. Um, so unity in diversity. We've all heard of it. What does it actually mean? Hmm. Yeah, it's such unity and diversity. It's such an intriguing phrase uh, because it actually describes the nature of reality. Now in his Bhaktivedanta purports, Prabhupada uses the phrase several times. Here are two of my favorites. Uh, quote, every one of us is an expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This accounts for unity in diversity. There are diverse manifestations, but at the same time, they are one in Vishnu. Everything is an expansion of Vishnu's energy. And there you see the slide. Everything's coming from Krishna. Uh, there's his internal potency, Srimati Radharani, and then all the universes are expanded. And he, of course, we hear he's in every atom, he's in our hearts. So unity and diversity. Now, here's my absolute favorite one. Uh, that first quote was from Bhagavatam. Here's CC, Sri Chaitanya Chaitamrita. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu confirms the conclusion of Srimad Bhagavatam on the strength of his philosophy of Achintya, Bedha Bheda Tattva. Oh, excuse me. Uh, just, yeah, okay. That philosophy holds that the Supreme Lord is simultaneously one with and different from his creation. That is to say, there is unity in diversity. So unity in diversity is another, none other than the, the English translation uh, of Chincha Bheda Bheda Tattva. Indeed, as the combined form of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna, Lord Chaitanya is the very embodiment of unity and diversity. And there's the slide where, what's that uh, famous uh, verse? Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahe Anya, right? So unity so, in diversity. So, so this uh, concept of, or the, the unity in diversity is actually a very deep and, and, and a lofty philosophical concept describing like how you say the totality of Krishna's creation, all of existence. Now, mm -hmm. coming to how, how did Srila Prabhupada apply this in, in, in practice in, in the movement in ISKCON? Mm. Yeah, great question. Actually, while expanding ISKCON, Prabhupada, he famously used the phrase in a letter 
to Kirtanananda Maharaj. When Maharaj wrote to Prabhupada, recording that there was dissension among the devotees, Prabhupada replied that material nature means dissension and disagreement. Then he advised Maharaj and all of us how we could overcome our differences. And there you see the slide. I'm just excerpting uh, from the letter. It says, uh, quote, the materialist cannot come into agreement with varieties, but if we keep Krishna in the center, then there will be agreement in varieties. This is called unity in diversity. So Prabhupada did not invent the phrase, but he used it uh, to, he started applying it to ISKCON in that way. And sometimes Prabhupada would, um, to illustrate what he meant, Prabhupada would sometimes give the example of concentric circles. No matter how many circles we draw, if we all, if they all those circles share the same center, they never clash. In the same way, even when differences arise, if pleasing Krishna is our shared intention, we'll at least be able to agree to disagree and continue working cooperatively to serve the Supreme Lord. Now, Prabhupada knew that this would be an ongoing challenge. So let's put up the second part of that. Second quote from that letter. Uh, that slide we had up before about uh, the GBC. Yeah, right. So later in the letter, and this is how we ended the letter. It's very significant. Quote, I am therefore suggesting that all our men meet in Mayapur every year during the birth anniversary of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. With all GBC and senior men present, we should discuss how to make unity in diversity. So that's what Prabhupada said way back in 73. It's finally become fashionable after all these years, after 50 some years, to actually do that. You could hear more and more talk about unity and diversity as uh, we keep discovering more and more our differences. Okay, how are we gonna, how are we gonna find unity amongst all our differences? So. As always, we just have to get back, uh, do back to basics, back to what Prabhupada advised us low these many decades ago. So, so, of course, there's a philosophical side, like you mentioned, but this unity and diversity sounds very important in practice. It's like, it's like that famous um, uh, instruction that Prabhupada gave in his last days that your love for me will be shown by how you cooperate, how you work together. Mm. And yet, um, uh, today on many issues, our movement ISKCON seems quite divided, um, and and uh, and there's lots of difference in opinion that are that are quite deep, and even emotional. So how do we actually achieve, you know, in in a practical, positive way, this uh, this goal of unity and diversity? Okay. Well, based on you know, based on Prabhupada's experience with his own spiritual master's mission, the Gaudiamat, Prabhupada knew, he really knew that the only way ISKCON could endure the ravages of time, because time is always trying to tear us apart, was through love, especially our love for him. Yeah, that quote you alluded to, your love for me will be shown by how you cooperate uh, when I leave. So to find that cooperation, we'll need to, that we'll need to work together despite our differences. We really need to dig deeper into Prabhupada's mood and mission. We need to identify, for example, timeless universal principles, then diversify the application of their details according to what Prabhupada called time, candidate, and country. So let's yeah, go to those slides. And you want to read the slide? Yeah, yeah, I'll just uh, read this slide here. The Prabhupada says, the teacher Acharya has to consider time, candidate, and country. What is possible in one country may not be possible in another. The Acharya's duty is to accept the essence of devotional service, which then... And then the next slide. Right. Yes, let's see. Ah, yeah, this one. It's not necessary. 
that the rules and regulations followed in India be exactly the same as those in Europe, America, and other Western countries. What is required is a special technique according to country, time, and candidate. This is actually from the purport, Chaitanya Chaitamrit. So it's- so What do you think about that? It's you interesting. Like that? It is interesting that he, he, he encapsulated this concept in the purport. It's not even just a you know, passing remark in, during a morning walk. <laughs> it's, it's an essential, essential point that in the application of Krishna consciousness, this concept is a universal concept, an ancient concept that yes, depending on where you are and the circumstances, uh, you have to adjust certain things and it will be different. Um, so so we, the idea is that, okay, we, we have to unite around the principles and the details may be diverse, you know, uh, where, which are adjustable. So that makes a lot of sense. And we see it in the world in, in any experience, uh, but we still remain quite divided because we can't seem to agree on what is an unchangeable bedrock principle and what is considered an adjustable detail. Now, how do we know, how do we identify or uh, recognize uh, the difference of what is uh, changeable and what is not? There is the rub. <laughs> That's an excellent, excellent question. And Prabhupada famously answered that question point blank. This, this, was, this happened in Manila in the Philippines in October, 1972. I'll give you a little backstory too. Uh, in March of that year, in 72, Prabhupada broke ground for the Mayapur project. And he invited a lot of his god brothers. And a lot of them came. Some of them didn't come, but a lot of them did come. And they were really amazed and pleased to see Swami Maharaj, as they called Prabhupada, their god brother. Uh, breaking ground for a grand international project in Mayapur. At the same time, they had issues with Prabhupada. And one of the issues was that he was allowing men and women to serve together in the same temples. And Prabhupada tried to explain to them, you know, what it was like preaching in the West. How, you know, from the time they're toddlers, they're mixing together freely, boys and girls, and you can't change a culture overnight. So, uh, okay, that was in March. And then in, in October, Sri Kirti is still his servant. You know, he, he logged more time than anyone actually as Prabhupada's servant because he was so good. He did two stints as a servant with Prabhupada. And <laughs> so this happened on uh, October 11th or 12th in Manila. Um, Sri Kirti is massaging Prabhupada. He gave a good massage too. And he was always behind Prabhupada when he'd massage him. So he couldn't see Prabhupada's expressions, but he'd ask him questions. And Prabhupada would just you know, give answers without Sri Kirti being able to see the expressions. So, so out of the blue, when Prabhupada uh, was being massaged, he said, now this is five months later, or maybe seven months, yeah, later. He said, uh, my god brothers criticize me and this the servants report this that Prabhupada, he was sometimes he would start a conversation and then he would pick it up sometimes months later <laughs> right from the point where he left off practically the right the right sentence so Prabhupada says my god brothers criticize me that i have allowed women to live in our temples this is not done in india but I have become successful because I made this adjustment. I mean, Prabhupada went so far as to say he credited his whole success by having the, the vision and the empowerment to allow men and women to serve together in the temples. Now, when Sri Dakirti heard that, he's, his mind started turning like, okay, I got to ask a question. His Prabhupada said, I have become successful because I made this adjustment. Uh -huh. So seeing an opportunity, Sri Kirti asked Prabhupada that $108 million question. Okay, let's go to the slide and you can read it, Prabhu. So Sri Prabhupada, how can we tell the difference between making an adjustment and changing a principle? Okay, don't go to the next words yet because... <laughs> 
because Prabhupada did not answer for a long time. When you hear the recordings of Srila Prabhupada, sometimes you hear Prabhupada going, hmm. So that's what Prabhupada was doing. <laughs> he was really, you know, ruminating on the question. And Shruti Kirti keeps, you know, the suspense is building as he's, you know, how, what's Prabhupada going to say? Is he going to say anything? Because that's, this is the question that, that bedevils us. How could we know the difference between, you know, what's adjustable and not adjustable? And then here's Prabhupada's answer. Go ahead. Prabhupada closed his eyes. So Shruti Kirti says, and I continue to rub his body. Finally, he opened his eyes and responded. That requires a little intelligence. <laughs> this is from Shri Prabhu's memoir, What is a Difficulty? Right? Yes. So what do you think of that? Intelligence requires a little intelligence. It's, it sounds like, <laughs> because it does. I mean, it sounds like it's an understatement of all time. It requires intelligence, of course. So many of, uh, so, so see, we, we know that Srila Prabhupada has so many god brothers. They're big scholars. They're very principled. They're, you know, accomplished sannyas, you know, teachers and sannyasis. And, and we see that Srila Prabhupada was massively, fabulously successful. And as a preacher, as an you know, expansion of Lord Chaitanya's mercy all over the world. And, you know, while they also had their preaching fields, they were nowhere nearly as successful as Srila Prabhupada. So what, what, is, what is that, uh, the difference? Where's the essence of that difference? Yeah, that's such a great question. Well, the short answer is that, that Prabhupada, among all of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's disciples, Prabhupada, our Prabhupada was empowered with the compassion and intelligence to know how to spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. I mean, just think about that, all over the world. Now, in some of his CC purports, Prabhupada even describes, describes how he was able to do that. And I'm going to share with you now two of my favorite purports, which I think in previous interviews on this uh, podcast has been touched on, but they're so important. I'm going to bring them up again from a little different angle. It's Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Leela, uh, text 37 and 38. First, we'll look at a, a, this is not on a slide, but I'm just going to share with you uh, the excerpt from the purport to 37. It's the absolute truth and five features. And this is where Prabhupada really gets into uh, applying the Shastra to Iskhan's unique situation. So Prabhupada says, quote, an acharya should devise a means by which people may somehow or other come to Krishna consciousness. First, they should become Krishna conscious, and all the prescribed rules and regulations may later gradually be introduced. That, of course, is a paraphrase of Rupa Goswami, yena tena prakarena, somehow or other, yena tena, somehow or other. And that's what Prabhupada did at 26 Second Avenue. You know, he was, uh, he would just, you know, these people were wandering into that little storefront looking to, for another way to get high, basically. The preaching was stay high forever. That was, that was the, the handbills they'd pass out to the people in the park because this is the counterculture. So Prabhupada would get them to chant. He got them addicted to the chanting and they were getting a higher taste and he got them addicted to prasadam. So somehow or other. <clears throat> And then after, even after a few initiations, Prabhupada didn't even, he, he mentioned the regulative principles. He did the first initiation in September, then, and then another one in Radhastami. First one was in his Vyasa Puja Day. And then he did another one in Radhastami a couple of weeks later. And then he did one in October. And then finally in November, one of the first initiates, came to Swamiji, as they called him, and said, Swamiji, um, you mentioned something about rules and regulations. Because <laughs> Prabhupada, he mentioned, he didn't even, he didn't even, he didn't ask them at, at initiation. So what are the four rules, you know, like you hear on the recordings? How many rounds, you know, that was later. That was later. But he was very lenient. He was very generous. So 
and then Prabhupada said, you know, very good boy. And then he, he hand wrote that famous paper that you see dated November 25th, 1966, all initiated devotees must. And it reads like a mini Hari Bhakti Vilas for the Lower East Side, you know, urban, little urban commune there. <laughs> so Prabhupada says, all the prescribed, first they should become Krishna conscious. And all the prescribed rules and regulations may later gradually be introduced. Sarve They should be made servants. This highest principle of getting people to be Krishna conscious. So in our Krishna consciousness movement, Prabhupada continues, we follow this policy of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. For example, and then he gets right into the biggest divisive issue, one of the biggest of our time, is right here. Since boys and girls in the Western countries freely intermingle, special concessions. Now, he's not talking about compromising the principles. He's talking about adjusting them so people can get aboard and still bring them to the highest levels of Krishna Bhakti. Uh, but in the beginning, you have to uh, consider the culture. Special concessions regarding their, Prabhupada very generously says, customs and habits <laughs> i mean we're living like cats and dogs right <laughs> so he says customs and habits are necessary to bring them to krishna consciousness the acharya must devise a means to bring them to devotional service okay that's an excerpt from 37 and then 38 he continues it he's he's he does this a lot in his purports he continues themes not only from the Shastra, but he continues themes from his application of the Shastra to his unique, what he uniquely did, spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. So from 38, this is a real uh, you know, zinger, quote, since the European American boys and girls in our Krishna consciousness movement preach together, less intelligent men Criticize, and this is exactly what happened, you know, in, in March 72. They were criticizing Prabhupada, and he's trying to explain to them. So now he puts it, he enshrines his explanation right in a, a Bhaktivedanta purport. Less intelligent men criticize that they are mingling without restriction. In Europe and America, boys and girls mingle unrestrictedly and have equal rights. There's another cultural marker. We're, they're raised to think that they're the same as far as opportunity and like that. Therefore, it is not possible to completely separate the men from the women. However, we are thoroughly instructing both men and women how to preach. And actually, they are preaching wonderfully. And it wasn't anything goes. You know, we were living in, the, uh, in Prabhupada's temples. And we had regulative principles. We weren't, uh, you know, doing anything scandalous. Um, but we were preaching side by side together and appreciating each other as a fellow missionaries. We were all missionaries. Whatever ashram we were in, in Prabhupada's time with us, we were all missionaries. And then Prabhupada continues, both men and women are preaching the gospel, borrowing a Christian word, of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Lord Krishna with redoubled strength. We're better together. We're better together. We're not, you know, what's Prabhupada going to do? Deny half the human race access to the mercy of Lord Chaitanya by keeping women away? No, we're better together. So he sees we're together anyway from the time we're toddlers. So now he brings us together under his guidance, practicing the disciplines of bhakti, the regulative principle. And amazing things happen. Therefore, it is a principle. It is a principle, Prabhupada says that a preacher must strictly follow the rules and regulations laid down in the Shastras, yet at the same time, devise a means by which the preaching work to reclaim the fallen may go on with full force. Yeah, there we go. And there's, there's the men and women together, or boys and girls together. Yeah. Amazing. And side by side, not front and back side by side <laughs> now it's this is this is actually for the traditionalists it was mind-blowing you know but men and women Prabhupada saying that preaching the gospel of lord chaitanya mahaprabhu uh, together with redoubled strength 
you know, he, he's highlighting that point that, you know, they, they not only get the opportunity to engage in this vital, crucial service, but it doubles our force overall in the world. And it's, it's incredible. I love it. So, so, uh, so since you have now applied this concept of unity and diversity to the mood and mission, and uh, so you can say MO, Srila Prabhupada, engaging men and women equally to spread Krishna consciousness. And this is not the only place he said it. He said it emphatically in many, many places. This is, this is not a one-off by any means. Um, so in parting, what would you like our viewers, our listeners to take away from this discussion today? Hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, I, don't, I think Prabhupada said it best in that last sentence in his purport to text 38, CC Adi 738, that, uh, well, here it is again. It is, quote, it is a principle that a preacher must strictly follow the rules and regulations laid down in the Shastras, yet at the same time, Prabhupada, he could chew burfi and walk at the same time. <laughs> he, could, he could do it all. He could be contemporary and he could be very traditional too. Yeah. Uh, let me just tell you, I'll, I'll, before I finish that quote, I'll, I'll digress to one of my favorite stories that Jamuna, the late great Jamuna Devi, my god sister, would tell about her, what happened with her and Prabhupada at the Kumbha Mela in 1971. And uh, yeah, the Ardha Kumbha Mela, the half Kumbha Mela, the six year. And so they were with Prabhupada, and Prabhupada just uh, was with his troops right there in the cold, in the sand, you know, in that spontaneous city of 30 million that springs up every, every year because there was a preaching opportunity. And so it's very austere, but Prampa was there and, and they had tents. They had their own tent. The, men, the women had a tent, the men had a tent, Prampa had his tent. And then during the day when it would warm up a little bit, they'd have preaching programs. And there was a it was a big tent for that. So um, so Jamuna tells how ever since she joined in, in the Haight Ashbury, you know, the, the counterculture capital of the world in the 60s, she was always used to sitting right in front of where Prabhupada was speaking to catch every word. She just lived to hear Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada was her everything and all, as he was for so many of us. But Jamuna would just sit right in the front. So she said one morning there was a, a, a program scheduled. And so she came in early to make sure she got her seat right in front of the podium where Prabhupada's going to speak in the tent. And people start coming in, you know, filing in because Prabhupada knew we were going to be a novelty. You know, was, there's Swami Bhaktivedanta with his dancing white elephants. And uh, so sure enough, people, all the Indian people were coming in. And then all of a sudden, just before Prabhupada started, or actually Prabhupada hadn't even come in yet. Yeah. Um, she, Jumuna hears uh, something from behind her. And it's a god brother, who was a sannyasi at the time. And she hears, Jumuna. And she looks behind her, and there's the, the Swami, and he's saying, uh, you see where the Indian ladies are sitting um, a little behind and around the side? Um, it'd be good if you sat with them. <laughs> but Jamuna, the way she tells the story, <laughs> used to tell the story, she, uh, she said, I was thinking, what? Sit behind? I, 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 I don't do that. I sit right in front, and, and Prabhupada knows that I, I live to hear him speak. So, so uh, but she thought, well, let me see what this is all about. So she gets up, you know, just sort of uh, curious to see what's gonna, going on here. So she goes behind, you know, with the Indian ladies kind of behind and to the side. And then Prabhupada comes in, and he gives his talk, and, you know, it's a wonderful talk, and then question and answer, he just... You know, he was really heavy with the Indian. He could be really heavy. You know, Bharata Bhumite Manusha Janma This is your duty. You're born. You have this fortunate birth. You've got to help us spread Sanatana Dharma all over the world. 
And so everybody claps and then uh, everybody files out, you know, and, and all the devotees are going about their duties. And then uh, now Prabhupada, he's in his tent and his tent, you know, these tents, they go down to maybe a foot above uh, the ground. So Prabhupada's in his tent, he's chanting Japa and he can see from where he's sitting in his tent, he can see all the devotees pass by his tent and he can see who they are by their dhotis and their saris, you know, he can, and their feet. He can tell who's coming, he's passing by. So then Jamuna passes by his tent and all of a sudden Jamuna hears Jamna, Jamna, you know, Prabhupada is a Bengali. And she, and she quickly realizes Prabhupada's calling her into, the, into his tent. So she goes in and she bows down and she says, yes, Srila Prabhupada. So then Prabhupada says, so uh, you do not like to hear me anymore? <laughs> too much. Jamuna immediately bursts out crying. She just, Prabhupada. <laughs> and then when she's, you know, when she, she stops sobbing and, and her chest is heaving, she, and she collects herself enough to describe what happened. You know, how this person, you know, one of his sannyasi disciples had suggested that she go behind with the Indian ladies. So then, then she says, Prabhupada, what should I do? And Prabhupada, he didn't say anything immediately. He just put his head down, Jamuna said. And Prabhupada said, yes, this is India. Ah. So now Jamuna is getting a, a hint that it's a different time and place. And that it's not the Haight-Ashbury. It's not the West, what to speak of the Haight-Ashbury. And that she was going to have to start cultivating, um, you know, at least while she was in India, more of a, a different uh, mood. She can't always be, you know, sitting up front with the men, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then Prabhupada said something else, which was really significant. She said, she, well, she, she asked the question. She said, Srila Prabhupada, how many times were you with your Guru Maharaj, you know, physically? And Prabhupada said, oh, maybe five or six times. But there was, those were very intimate times. Guru Maharaj would always like to share something confidential with me. And sometimes the God brothers would criticize that, oh, fools rush in mm. because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta would invite this disciple, Abhaya Charanaravinda Das, to sit with him together on the same seat. And the God brothers, that, that raised eyebrows, fools rush in. And Prabhupada would say, fool I may have been, but what could I do? Guru Maharaj was insisting I sit right next to him. And then and then Prabhupada said, Guru Maharaj told me that those who wanted to always be with him physically, you know, seen with him. Prabhupada said, uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, they were like mosquitoes, simply sucking blood, you know, taking from the Guru, being seen with the Guru as though I'm the intimate disciple, right? So that was a very telling anecdote that Prabhupada told her because then she got the idea that, she, that what she'd been hearing about serving as separation, that's a more intimate kind of association. And Prabhupada would always say that. Uh, there's never a moment when I don't feel my Guru Maharaj right by my side. So she knew she was gonna that she would have to start cultivating that, along with and she still did a lot of intimate service even physically. You know, in October seventy two, she was the cook at Radha Damodar, who would serve Prabhupada his meals every day. We have that famous photo that Vishaka took of Prabhupada taking his meal and looking out the window at Rupa Goswami Samadhi. Just and and Jamuna was the one who invited her. You know, just before uh, Prabhupada took prasad. He said, Vishaka, bring your camera. You got to see what I'm seeing. That Prabhupada's taking his lunch and he's looking out at the samadhi of Rupa Goswami. 
So she had a lot of opportunities. And later she and Gurudas, her, her husband at the time, were, help, were the ones that actually started uh, to staying in Vrindavan to, to start the construction of Krishna Balaram Mandir. You know, to spread Krishna consciousness worldwide across many different cultures, we really need to imbibe Prabhupada's uh, vision. He didn't preach the same in, in the West and the East mm -hmm. at all. It was very different. I mean, the same principles, but his application of Krishna consciousness really looked different in, in the West and, and, and the East. Um, so similarly, when we're preaching, we to, need to imbibe Prabhupada's, his vision. That is, uh, we need to learn how to be faithful to our Guru Parampara, yet always fresh in how we present Krishna consciousness according to the time, the place, and the people. And you say, what takeaway do you want people to have from this uh, video? Well, I think by what's more, what by following Prabhupada, his mood of equally engaging men and women, to expand the Guru Parampara. Um, we act, when we do that, we actually learn from each other how to spread Krishna consciousness with intelligence and compassion. Because men and women bring different gifts to the table, how we minister to people, and we can learn from each other. And without that diversity, <clears throat> uh, unity, it kind of just devolves. It degrades into a kind of dry stereotyped uniformity. And without unity, without uniting around the principles, diversity devolves into the chaos of anything goes. That's the modern disease, you know, it feels good. Sense gratification is, is the religion of the modern age, no matter what people call themselves, this and that. So Prabhupada's unity in diversity saves us from both extremes of just unity or just diversity. And it provides a path for us to truly reconcile our differences. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's wonderful that Shri Prabhupada has given us this principle of innovation that there's, you will always find yourself, because times change, yeah. you'll find yourself needing innovation. At the same time, applying our intelligence to remain loyal to the base bedrock principles and make sure the guardrails are always in place. Mm. Um, and, and the fact that Shilip Prabhupada's own example, like you mentioned, the wonderful examples uh, that he innovated. Um, and he would also mention, uh, maybe I'll quote also one letter that I particularly like I shared also in our chat. He wrote to Himavati, he says, I'm especially proud how my householder disciples are preaching Lord Chaitanya's mission. Then he says, this is a new thing in the history of Sankirtan movement, a new thing. Mm. And he gives, the, he gives the perspective, he says in India, at the time of the Acharyas and their descendants, they acted only from the man's side. Their wives were at home because that was the system from old times that women were not required to go out. But now Shri Prabhupada, then he explains his innovation, but he still says it's rooted in Bhagavad Gita. He says, but in Bhagavad Gita, we find that women are also equally competent like the men in the matter of Krishna consciousness movement. And then he says, please therefore carry on these missionary activities and prove it by practical example that there is no bar for anyone in the matter of preaching uh, for preaching work Krishna. So he's, he's, he's saying several things here. He's saying that he's doing something new that was never done before. He's giving the historical context that in Acharya's times, it wasn't done in olden times. So that's understandable. Mm -hmm. But he's also saying based on Bhagavad Gita, we can make this innovation. So he's saying mm -hmm. the guardrail of Bhagavad Gita is still there. And he's saying, you all please prove it for me. Hmm. You know, so he's putting that on our shoulders. So it's so nice the way you, you frame the whole uh, point that we should remain loyal to the principles, apply our intelligence and in where and how to adjust it. And we've got so many clues, so many precedents set by Srila Prabhupada himself. We don't need to do too much you know, undue uh, squeezing of our intelligence. He's given so many uh, examples of how uh, he was bold and which which parts uh, he he chose to not go off the you know reservation you know, these things are principles so it's so wonderful Prabhu, the examples you gave the framework that you provided on unity and diversity 
And I'm extremely grateful. And I really hope our listeners can uh, take something valuable from this and can share this far and wide. Um, and thank you so much for your time. If you have any last few words in parting. I think that is said at all, but yeah, unity and diversity. It's such as, it's just three words, but packed into those three words is really the key of how we're gonna survive the ravages of time and stay together. Yeah, thank you so much. Feel it, Prabhupada. Key. Yeah, very good. Very good.